Hello and welcome to our first Startup Global webinar of 2024, uh, your checklist to export. I'm Isabel Nolan, Program Manager for the Startup Women and Startup Global programs at Startup Canada. To begin, I would like to acknowledge the land on, on, on which I am on today, uh, which is located on the unceded and traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations, also known as Vancouver. Uh, I also acknowledge with respect the diverse history and culture of all Indigenous peoples, and I encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory you're residing on today. Today's session is being recorded, and we will be sharing it afterwards on our YouTube channel. I invite all of our attendees to introduce yourselves and connect with each other in the chat. Uh, feel free to share your name, your organization, where you're joining in from. Uh, make sure you are sending your messages to everyone in the room. Zoom defaulted to only send it to just hosts and panelists, so you'll just need to adjust that to, to make sure you're talking to everyone. A little bit about Startup Canada. Uh, we're a national nonprofit that's the gateway to Canada's entrepreneurial ecosystem. We're here to connect entrepreneurs with the support, community, and tools that they need to build a successful business in Canada. Since launching in 2012, Startup Canada has supported more than 130,000 entrepreneurs annually and an ever growing grassroots community network from coast to coast to coast. Startup Global is one of Startup Canada's flagship programs that supports entrepreneurs looking to export and expand their business internationally. From webinars such as this one uh, to export readiness resources and exclusive offerings from our partners, this free program will help you build international market entry strategy and plan. I'd like to take a moment to thank um, our fantastic partners. So our co-presenting partners are UPS and Export Development Canada. And one of our uh, speakers are from today. Uh, as well as our program partners, Forum for International Trade Training, or FIT. Also one of our speakers is from, from that a wonderful organization. Our ecosystem partners, Scotiabank and Startup TNT, and our community partners, GS1, North Forge, Toronto uh, Region Bot, IPIC, ICTC, and NCFDC. So today's conversation is focused on getting ready to export. So starting to sell, uh, into a new market. It's an exciting phase and a milestone in any startup's journey. However, this journey is uh, can also be quite overwhelming. Um, so there's many steps that you can take to entering a new market. And today's discussion will walk you through all the key factors to consider before you're ready to begin exporting. We've prepared some questions for our panelists. However, if you do have any questions, you can write it in the Q&A box on the bottom function bar on your screen, and we'll do our best to have it answered live. So without further ado, I'm honored to introduce our speakers for the day. Speakers, maybe when I introduce, you can give a little wave. Uh, so we have Laura Raguto. She is a CITP, so Certified International Trade Professional, and also is the Partnerships and Community Leave at, Lead at FIT. Emiliano Intracasso, uh, he is the EDC Advisor and Senior Product Operation Manager at EDC. And Nancy Wingham is the co-founder of Nuas Acres. Welcome panelists. Thank you so much for uh, joining us today and very excited to get straight into the discussion. We've got lots to, to cover today. So um, we'll get we'll get right to it. Uh, so to start off today's discussion and to help frame, frame it for our attendees, uh, can you each speak to the importance of creating a solid export plan? Um, Laura, I'll, I'll go to you first. Okay, thanks, Isabel, and thank you. Thank you for the invite to be here today. I love to help entrepreneurs as they start on their export journey, their journey to expanding into new and exciting markets, which don't come with their own uh, complexities. So um, when I'm happy that your first webinar for this year is about, you know, creating an export plan because it's it's just fundamental uh, to the success of your of your venture. So, you know, as the adage goes, if you're if you fail to plan, essentially you're planning to fail. And I do truly believe that. I mean, the, the export plan really can be a, a blueprint to help your company navigate the, the many complexities inherent in discovering and trying to enter into new markets, um, setting goals and objectives and communicating these these goals and objectives, what you're planning to do. Um, with your stakeholders. So it could be your staff, your managers, your investors, your outside directors, suppliers, lenders, funders, uh, potential new investors. It's really important to 
to articulate this, to communicate this, to have it in your export plan. Um, and it also, at the exercise of going through export planning, putting it down in a concise plan is a really good exercise for, for, for startups, for any organization to, to embark on because it, it flushes out those areas, those gaps that you may need to fill. So, um, you know, identifying cash needs, identifying maybe timelines, and uh, and then also having in the export plan that those evaluation um, and control so that you know how you're doing. Like it's great. Everybody says, oh, I'd like to you know enter into enter into a new market, the United States, but you need those those goals and 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 those measures in there and then evaluating where are you? Are we on track? Do we need to tweak something? So the export plans just serve so many purposes, but really it helps you be organized, which will ultimately, I think, lead to greater success. So Emiliano, I don't know. Um, yeah, sure no, as, as we were talking, I'm I'm remembering some of the clients. Sometimes they come in with all these different countries they want to go to, right? And it's like exciting to to be able to talk to them and see. Oh, you want to go to twenty countries, but I I'm always the one that has to stop <laughs> and say, "Hey, hello, okay, let's look at what you have, and let's start searching for the right market, right?" And obviously, there's a lot of different ways to go through like the market selection in terms of how you want to. Uh, pick the the market that is going to be for you, and um, the one of the things that you could do is you know um, um, obviously through the market research uh, process, right? You're gonna discard some of the markets, right? As as maybe there's some markets that are more risky for you at the moment, maybe some markets that are not the ones that are right for your product, etc. And then you know you have the two or three markets that are like you know the markets that you can select. Obviously, you always start with one market. I always uh, recommend only starting with one market. And that is the one that you're going to put in your export plan. You're going to start with that one. You're going to put in all the information that is required for the for the plan. There's different sections on the plan. Um, there's templates, I think, that, uh, that, we, that we can share uh, through the fit resources and all that. Uh, and there's information that you're going to, uh, you know, basically select to, to really go and move forward in this plan. Once you've completed the the plan and you know you access that market, then you're wondering, oh, well, what's my next plan? My what my my next uh, country or market is gonna be like, right? But you already need that resource, right? Because we went from twenty markets to like three or two. Now you can go to the next uh, market that you uh, discarded in the past, and then you can start the process again. And it's always important to create an export plan for every market you are accessing, not just one export plan and then like put it aside and let it collect dust right uh, an export market uh, plan is always a living document what i like to call it you know you modify it as it goes you know there's changes or strategies that you have to to change you know do them but the actual plan itself is going to really inform the rest of the company how you're going to take on your uh, your product to that market right and involve the people that are supposed to be involved at the table from your logistics areas, um, you know, personnel, maybe the salespeople always include the top people, right? Like those people have to um, to be pretty much involved and, and be ready to take on the challenge because it is a challenge trying to go into another market. So um, I think that's a, a good introduction. I'm sure that Nancy has some other uh, other thoughts there to add um, for her own experience that uh, as she expanded her company. Yeah, so just as a small business, right, sometimes it can be a little bit daunting writing an export plan because there are so many things that you do have to keep in mind when looking at different um, markets. So like, um, so everything in there, but it really um, serves as a roadmap to how to do that, right? So um, and also helps you identify in some cases like where your company is at as you're writing the plan, you, you might be realized like, oh, maybe my packaging is not ready for that market or maybe I don't have the funds to expand to where I want it to expand. So just putting everything on uh, down, it just really gives you like a big idea of where you're at, if you're ready, what you need and how to get to that. And as Emiliano mentioned too, right? Like you have to really make sure that it is fluid um, because that's when you start, um, there's so many things that can change. So being able to be flexible with that plan 
is also key to success with the business. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you for each sort of giving a um an overview of of the importance of it. Um and and Laura, I love what you said. You know, it's not. It, or rather it is a blueprint right and and Nancy it, it's a it's a roadmap to your company's success and Emilio as you said like it's um it's it's going to change over time it's not something you make once and that's it and it's not a copy and paste you know for all the different markets you're going to go to it really is um very much targeted to to where you're intending to to, to go um, so thank you for for that little overview. And uh, you each sort of mentioned different components of an export plan. Um, and for our attendees, you know, we're going to walk, walk through um, what some of these key components are that you should be um, including in your export plan um, and, and going through at a high level what each of these entail. Um, so Miliana, you, you mentioned target market. Um, so, you know, target market research can be, if not is, the most important contributor to your international success. Um, so you want to ensure you're entering into a market that's the right fit for, fit for your product or service. So um, Emiliana, maybe I'll, I'll go to you first. How can uh, Canadian entrepreneurs effectively conduct their market research to identify these viable international markets for their products or their services um, and useful resources and tools that uh, they could maybe use to conduct this research? Well, the, the main thing is sometimes, uh, you know, companies do not know, right? And one of the reasons they, they may start with a particular market is because they have gotten some inquiries from there. Now, doesn't necessarily mean that that is the right market to go with right away, but sometimes it is, right? So the thing you have to do is to validate if that is the right market right away or not. And the idea here is to conduct that market research by looking at different sources, right? Um, don't just stay with what, let's say, EDC or what uh, the Trade Commissioner Service has to say. Look beyond that information. Obviously, uh, we have like tons of knowledge and we do a lot of research on these markets that are available, but we want you to, um, to you know, do the work. It is a lot of work. That first part, I think, is probably the most important and the most uh, tedious in terms of timing that you're going to invest on to researching the market. But uh, there's different ways to do the, the market research, right? You, you obviously start with secondary research, which is you look at everything that has already been published uh, on that market regarding like the actual market itself, maybe the industry that you're targeting, the industry of your product, and see what those um, key components or key highlights are. And then one of the things that I always uh, suggest to, to companies is to if you're already seeing what, let's say, the Trade Commissioner Service or EDC has to say about a particular market, right? We have information that is on our knowledge page. Um, see what other markets are saying, because the United States or Australia or the UK, they all want their exporters to do the same thing we do. We are not the only the only people in, in, in the world that want our own businesses to export, because you know, exporting is great, brings all that extra money back into the market. And it helps develop the economy, right? So all the markets or all the countries want to do the same thing. We want to do is want to hear what other um, other um, countries or other governments are saying about the market you want to go to. So for example, let's say you wanted to go to uh, Italy. Um, okay, we have information. Trade Commissioners has information. Maybe there's the Canadian Italian Association here that, or the Chamber of Commerce that can give you some more information. But what about like what the United States is telling? the exporters in the US about Italy? What about the Australian government? What are they telling their exporters about what doing business in Italy looks like? Uh, what about the United Kingdom, right? All these different governments have this resource guys or exporters guys for their own businesses locally. So, you know, we have the beauty of the internet. You can actually access those through, through the internet as well and see what everybody else is saying. And then you're gonna have like this sort of 360 view of what that market looks like from the different angles of uh, of the world. Um, and using that type of resource to me is one of the things that, you know, um, if, if the company currently is just starting up and you don't have like the resources to hire, let's say a consultant or a CATP, um, this is one of the things you could do on your own. 
of course it's going to take time right so it's either you pay or you you know have a consultant or you do it yourself ideally if it's your own business i always say do as much as you can to get yourself informed at some point you're going to need the help right but at least you're coming into the into the um, situation or into the actual conversation with a lot of like ammunition right of understanding how the market is and how it, it may it may impact Wonderful. Thank you, Emiliano. Uh, Laura, I wonder, do you have anything to add to what uh, he, he said? Yeah, no, that was great, Emiliano. Um, I had a couple of things come to mind. So, you know, I know that with um, with startups, with, with uh, small scale entrepreneurs, there's always that feeling we have to do it all ourselves. But just research takes time and time is money. And sometimes you can spend hours and hours trying to find that information, that industry specific information in the target market. Sometimes it actually is more valuable for you to pay someone, pay a consultant, pay, you know, uh, some intermediary in the market that could obtain that information that you wouldn't be able to, to obtain yourself. So the ROI on that paid research in the long run may be more beneficial to you. Um, and, and I just want to take it back, you know, one step, like when you're doing your trade research, you're, you're, you're assessing the feasibility as well. Like, are you actually export ready? Like before you even start looking at the markets, you've got to determine if your organization is export ready. Like, do you have the capital that's required? Do you have that human resources capacity um, that you need to do your research? Even to know, even if you're going to pay for it, you need an individual, a champion within your organization that's going to know who to reach out to to get that information. And it could be EDC, it could be the Trade Commissioner Service, it could be your provincial government, but you need to have that human resource capacity um, to understand, you know, are you export ready? If you are, you know, do you have a market like or is it feasible to export to that target market and and then you can start start researching so um emiliana you mentioned you know foreign trade offices um uh, you know you mentioned obviously industry associations chambers of commerce it's a great source of information um yeah i think you you sort of covered them all Thank you so much, Laura and and Nancy. You know you're you're our entrepreneur uh, on our panel today, so you can really speak to the experience that an entrepreneur might be going through in in this stage. So, for you, when you were looking at which markets to to export to, were there any? Well, how did you conduct this research? And uh, any useful tools or resources that you used along the way? Um, yeah, so um, because we are a product based company, so we really um, we use um, online platforms as well, right? So uh, doing the research, we um, we use the trade commissioner, the export navigator, so all the offices to make sure that we were ready to export our products so that our products were um, able to be crossing borders, right? So we obviously, because we are so close to the US, the US is a large market. So that's where we first focused in there. So how we did it, um, it's just, as I mentioned, like online, right? Direct to consumer, um, as opposed to go to a large retailer, just to make sure, you know, the product was something that consumers were wanting in that, um, in those areas. So we used Amazon, uh, we've used uh, wholesale platforms as well, where we are just listing the products to see um, if there's any um, interest in the products where we're shipping directly to smaller um, stores. So we're using Fair, we're using Bulletin. Uh, mm -hmm. We are also using another platform that's called Range Me. I can put it on the chat as well. So all these are platforms where you are able to put your product in, list your products in. Uh, there is no cost to do it, um, but that gives you a platform where you are having the eyes of international shoppers. Um, so that gives you a little bit of um, boost without having to spend so much money in, um, in terms of going to like trade shows or sending samples directly 
and things like that. So that's something that we have used um, in terms because we do have an online website and online platform as well. So we have really um, used the data that that collects. So we use Shopify at the moment. So we're really able to see where all the customers are coming from, like in terms of the US. Um, if we see there is a larger um, interest in that area, then we focus on that area in terms of contacting maybe smaller retailers or maybe doing marketing um, in that area to uh, gather more direct to consumers. Um, also, I would say um, if you are really looking into, um, if you're a product based company, a small company, I mean, resources are very, very tight all the time, right? And as our Laura mentioned, um, it is really hard to do everything. So investing that money maybe in a consultant, um, it definitely, it is worth it. Um, there's definitely grants out there that you can apply for, like can export, uh, that will pay some of the um, uh, fees that you um, inquire to do that. Um, but that's something that it's very necessary um, in terms of the market, especially if you're going to, uh, like on a larger scale. If you want to start on a smaller scale, then as I mentioned, just use those platforms just to make sure that you're ready and then there's interest on that market. Thank you, Nancy, for, for giving us that 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 side of the page. Um and and we have a question in the QA box that I just wanted to answer quickly, um, asking which websites do we recommend for, for market research on export opportunities? Um both FIT and EDC have in incredible resources on um, you know, building your your export plan, uh, entering your target market, all of that. Um, uh, we can share those links to uh, the website again into the chat. Uh, another one that I'm also familiar with is the Google Google Market Finder. And uh, that's another great tool that you can use. Uh, it's free to use. Um, so we can add that into the chat as well. So there's a few websites off the top of my head um, and Trade Commissioner Service as well. They've, they've also got some fantastic export uh, resources that, that you can utilize for sure. Um, all right. So another important question to consider when you're entering a new market is, are there any specific regulations within this new market that you need to be aware of? So things like tariffs and duties, um, customs documentation, product standards. Um, so uh, Emiliana, maybe I, can I go to you first on um, how important is it for entrepreneurs to understand the regulatory landscape of the target market before exporting their pro uh, products? Yeah, so that is that is key because sometimes in your, uh, you know, your product may require specific permits, for example. Um, today, this morning, I was dealing with a company trying to export ice cream to the U.S. They were not sure exactly what to go about. And obviously, there's regulations with the Food and Drug Administration, right? The FDA requires some specific permits for this. There's also quotas. Luckily, we're not under those quotas for, for this particular product, but there's products on dairy, right? So uh, depending yeah. on which markets you are exporting to or exporting from, the United States have specific quotas as well and, and restrictions. So yeah, knowing those specific uh, regulations is key. Every product obviously is very different, right? So there's it, there isn't just one regulation for everything. It's uh, regulated by the industry. And so one of the things that you, you must do, I guess, is besides doing that research on the trade regulation specifically, is to enlist the help of a customs broker, for example, that could actually take you uh, step by step through that. And that is money well spent because they do this every single day. They are the experts on when it comes to trading goods uh, into another market. And they will know exactly for cosmetics, this will be the regulation for something that is specific to food uh, or beverages. Well, this will be the regulation. They'll know exactly where um where to find information they might have already done it in many cases several times so they are very very familiar with it but yeah it's important to understand that because you may have to modify your product right depending on the regulation if it's something that is modifiable and and that's something that means that an adaptation to the product must be done uh or if something that um you know you have access to you just get the permit and it's very easy right there's also permits um, that may be required when actually exporting out of Canada as well. So depending on the product that you have, that may be something else. So uh, for example, like the CFIA, like the Canadian Food Inspection Agency may have some specific requirements for product being exported as well as product being imported into the country. 
Thank you, Emiliano. And, and Laura, uh, the, the same to you, you know, any, um, any advice on, on, um, on having knowledge within this, this landscape for entrepreneurs before they're exporting their products? Yeah, this is, uh, this is that when we talk regulatory landscape, it's a very big landscape. <laughs> so we have everything as, you know, as Emilio men Emiliano mentioned, you know, that those trade specific trade regulations, and then those um, industry specific regulations, you mentioned, you know, CFIA, well, when you're, uh, you know, for other countries that are trying to export their products to Canada, they have to be very familiar with CFI, CFIA's regulations or Health Canada, depending what the product is. So you have to then understand the regulations particular to your, that are industry specific, product specific. So, you know, if it's health and welfare, like if it's a consumable product, you all those regulations, but as well, then there's regulations on labeling and on packaging, packaging materials that you can or cannot use. You know, what should your label, what must your label say, what information in what, you know, what unit of measure, all that. Um, then you have environmental additional, in some countries, you have additional environmental regulations, you know, the end of life for your product. Um, and that's very market specific. And then one thing sometimes that's overlooked when we look at the whole regulatory landscape is that that contractual side, like if you were to contract a sales agent in a market, um, the do's and don'ts, like what you can and cannot um, say in your, your contract and, and uh, remuneration for your sales agent in some jurisdictions, even if they don't, if they're on, for example, a commission basis, but if they don't make any money, there are regulations in certain markets where you do have to pay your sales agent for basically the effort and for the opportunity that that individual would have lost by just focusing on, you know, being the agent for your particular company. So there are a lot of there are a lot of regulations, and this is an area where a lot of time needs to be spent. And as Emiliano said, sometimes you need to hire someone that knows more than you do. And, and I would wager to say, you know, it, it, you, you don't know everything and you can't possibly know everything. So just knowing who you need to contact to get that information in this whole, uh, you know, the regulatory landscape, which has so many different facets to it. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you, Lauren. I think it's worth mentioning to our attendees, um, uh, you know, we're, we're hitting a few of these components, the key components at a high level. Each of them does have quite more um, meat to it. Um, and we, we will, within the Startup Global program this year, we will be tackling some of these a lot more in depth. Um, so the likes of, you know, regulations uh, we'll be covering during another webinar about like supply chain logistics. So if you do want to learn more about that specific topic, um, we will be hosting a webinar uh, specifically on that. Um, but Nancy, I'm, I, I'd love for you to talk about your experience. Um, so if you're able to share any um, experience or, or lessons learned regarding uh, regulatory challenges when you're entering your new market. Yeah, I mean, we have made a lot of mistakes, <laughs> um, but thankfully uh, on a smaller scale. So that's um, that's something really important when you're starting to expand. I always suggest just start um, very small, right? Because if you make a mistake, which we will at the beginning, um, then it's on a smaller scale. Like, for example, uh, we ship some products to a different country and um, you know, because it was a smaller order, we decided to just ship it by ourselves. Uh, we didn't understand really the market that we were entering. Uh, long story short, the package never made it in uh, because we just didn't have the proper paperwork. So we ended up losing, you know, a few hundred, um, a few hundred dollars, which wasn't that bad on a large scale. But that was, um, you know, we learned from that, right? Like understanding what kind of paperwork you need to have when you're shipping. Um, if you're shipping by yourself, then you need to really make sure that you do have all that paperwork um, that it is needed for the market. Um, as Emiliano mentioned, you know, sometimes depending on the size of the order, uh, it might be worth it hiring a broker because then you will be sure that you have 
all that paperwork as well. Um, and same with like Laura mentioned, uh, different uh, um, markets have specific regulations, not only just on the product as well, uh, but how you are marketing. Like for example, we were planning to do a trade show in the US and we sent all these marketing material for the trade show. And uh, we just realized, you know, like we had some things in there that were not allowed because we just, uh, the marketing on the, on the marketing because it just was not up to regulations so we had to go back and thankfully we hadn't printed anything at that point but we had to go back and change all of the wording to make sure that we were not making any claims because then that could lead to a lawsuit and then you know it's very costly so um, hiring a consultant um, or a broker when you can then that is um, it's huge which I know sometimes it can cost a lot of money and maybe for a smaller orders, um, it's not feasible, but for larger orders, then definitely do that. And then one thing I want to mention, uh, when you are going into an export, another market, um, sometimes like we encounter two different companies in two different markets where we thought we have found a distributor. Uh, thankfully, we did a little bit of background check. We checked with the trade commissioner to make sure those companies were actually um, a legal company. They were not a fake company. It turned out those companies were not uh, were not in good standards. So mm -hmm. to make sure, like you really do your homework, right? Um, not only just with the regulations, but also with the companies that you are looking to work for, because. There are a lot of companies out there that are just looking to scam companies that are not from that market, right? So it is really easy to be like, oh my God, I found, you know, this company looks great. But if you don't do the, the background um, research, then you can lose money as well in that sense. Absolutely. And I think, you know, a lot of what most of you are saying is, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And recognizing that and bringing someone in to support you um when when that's the case you know whether it's you know reference checking like you said Nancy or Emiliano um you know bringing in a um a broker to to support with um that you know the logistical sides of things um are are incredibly useful because you know it is it is just such a huge landscape so whenever you can lean on on someone or or um work or collaborate with with someone that is more expertise in that uh, specific field, and um, you'll definitely be a lot more successful, I believe, in in your endeavors. Um, I see a few questions coming into the Q and A, so I, I'll hold off on those for a moment, and if we can get to them by the end, we we absolutely will. Um, and uh, Nancy, there is a question for you in the chat just about the different websites that you had mentioned. Um, I believe Fair was one of them, which is one I'm familiar with as well. Um, if you wouldn't mind adding that to the chat. Um, so this this sort of ne next component is is definitely more applicable to um product based companies, um, but also it can be applicable if you're if you're service based as well. So in in line with you know regulations, um, in the new market, there may also be. Um, changes that you might need to make to your packaging um, or perhaps applying for a, a certain um, a, a certification that's specific to that region um, or adjusting how you market your product um, to or product or service uh, to this new market. Um, and Nancy, I know you mentioned something about uh, marketing materials, um, but Laura, are there what types of modifications should entrepreneurs anticipate might be required to meet the preferences and regulations of that new market? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, it's so individual depending on the product or service being exported, but you have everything from making very little, uh, very few modifications, uh, maybe just modifications um, in order to be able to uh, sell the product in a new market, let's put it on a shelf, like those labeling changes, changes to the packaging, translating into the different uh, language of the target market, everything from that to then making major modifications in order to be able to comply with standards or regulations 
um, in the market, like in terms of, let's say there's a, a safety standard or a um, any energy conservation standard, right, that you need to comply with or environmental standard. Um, but then you also could look at modifications in terms of marketability of your product or service. So what are the unique tastes and preferences and the, you know, what, what do your customers, it all boils down to what are your customers looking for, whether that's B2B, B2C, what do I need to modify in order to be, you know, to sell my product or make my product more marketable. So those are considerations. Could be something even simple as size, color, whatever that might be. But the important thing to understand is that you have to do a cost benefit analysis because modifications are, you know, inexpensive. It, there is a cost associated with that. So I worked in the whole clean technology space and we had these models that we created for our products, but those models, they, they were, you know, thousands of dollars. So do you have, <laughs> do you have the budgets to be able to tweak your product, create a new model or a new mold for each, each country you're going into? So you do have to weigh the cost yeah. benefit of that. Fantastic point, Laura. Thank you. Uh, Emiliano, um, anything to add to, to that point and adaptations? Sorry, I was muted. Uh, mm -hmm. On the adaptations, yeah, it's it's really understanding those those um, those adaptations sometimes may come from the regulations as well, right? Like, uh, and as simple as something like including, you know, an adapter for you know the plug that you're gonna use for your product in the European Union, for example, right? Or facilitating the specifics um, uh, of um, privacy laws let's say in the different countries, right? All those type of adaptations or regulations sometimes may have impacts on the way that you modify your product or service as well. So, yeah. Thank you. And, and Nancy, for yourself, I know you you mentioned um, one or two, but are there any other um, product adaptations that you had to had to make um, for, for that new market? Um, yeah, um, yeah, so I mean, definitely, keeping up with the regulations, right? Like for example, the US um, has recently changed the regulations in terms of packaging to make sure that um, the company's information is on the packaging and not just the distributors. So what they've done with cosmetics is um, whoever's information is on your packaging, on your labels, um, that is the person responsible for the end product, right? So you have to make sure that you have your phone number, website, uh, means for somebody to contact you in case something goes wrong. So that is understanding mm. the market once again, but then also um, understanding the cultural background, right? Of where you're going to in markets, uh, because, you know, if you're using a certain word or a certain photo or a certain color that it might not be applicable or it might be maybe offensive in another culture in another country. So you really have to be aware of all of these things not only regulations but cultural uh, background is good and then I will tell you a story too that we did um, we um, we shipped uh, one of our products to Mexico which is obviously super hot um, and then we realized you know the product um, is not good in the heat so we had to pull back all of the product from the market because you know obviously it was melting so really understanding your products which now we came up with this uh new adaptation i don't know if you can see because it it's yellow as well uh which is now um it can adapt to like high heat right so going from that mistake where you know we really didn't understand maybe the stores in there like where the product was going to be sitting was going to be hot so the product itself was not um good for that specific market uh, to now pivoting to something else, which could be more adaptable to that. Case. That's, a, that's a great example of, of um, learning a lesson and, and, and shifting and adapting. And, and, you know, you created a new whole new packaging line um, to, to support that. So I think that's a really good takeaway for entrepreneurs today. Um, I also remember someone uh, having a chat with someone a, a, similarly around adaptations um even you know ensuring that your website for that that uh, 
that country reflects um you know the um if, for example you know if you if you're uh, buying something in Canada it's .ca so you know if you're going to the UK perhaps you want your website to be .co.uk um or ensuring that you know the price that they're seeing it's clear that it, they're either buying it in the local currency or what the exchange rate might be so even transparency like that for that new market are 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 small adaptations but might be uh, the difference between someone buying your product and and not or buying your service and not buying it so even things like that to to take into consideration um when when going to your new market yeah that's um sorry to interrupt you Isabel, but yeah. yeah that's great i mean especially a lot of people nowadays are shopping online and not just in your area right like we do get a lot of customers from different countries shopping and um, just to mention like Shopify it's great because you are able to add all these currencies um, into your products which we've noticed that since we did that upgrade into adding the currencies our U.S. orders have um, skyrocketed because people are able to see the price right like they feel more yeah. comfortable I think just shopping in their own currency as opposed to having to convert and then shop absolutely yeah and it's it's building that trust then between your company and and the customer and they're probably more likely to come back if they have a more smooth interaction rather than buying it and not thinking that it's in one currency and actually it's in uh, another so um I, I definitely think that that stands to to that as well um so i would like to lightly touch on sort of the legal and ip protection side of things um, like I said, each of these components could be their own webinar um, topic and, and discussion um, on their own. Um, but the, today's discussion is really to make you aware of these these key components. Um, so we won't we won't get too bogged down. We won't um, scare anyone off with, with the legal side of things. But I think it is definitely worth mentioning um, to, to make you aware. Um, so uh, Emiliano, maybe I'll go to you first. Um, you know, from a legal standpoint, what should entrepreneurs consider before they're they're starting to export? You know, how can they ensure that they're protecting both themselves and their business uh, when entering a new market? Yeah. So in terms of legal, um, and and in almost any of the categories that we've discussed so far, I think it's always to understand that risk mitigation is key for anything regarding, um, you know, financial or legal stuff or regulations as well. Um, so as long as um, when it comes to like contracts, for example, you are making sure that you're uh, involving a lawyer, a trade lawyer that can actually guide you through what the specifics, uh, let's say, uh, terms and conditions of your contracts are going to be like. That's something that it will help mitigate any potential risk, right? Um, if you were just to grab a trade, um, a um a regulation like an agreement from of the internet right mm -hmm. uh yeah it might be well well written but it's not specific to your business right so a lot of uh, a lot of uh, businesses or entrepreneurs they they just you know want to do it fast and 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 very economically speaking and that's not going to mitigate the risk right so it may help you a little bit but it's not the right way to do it it is important that you uh, hire a lawyer uh, or somebody that's going to look at that type of uh, scenario and make sure that, um, you know, uh, you're covered. When you're sending an invoice, you're going to have to terms and conditions. When you're providing a service, let's say if you're an exporting service uh, type of company, you're going to be uh, providing um, terms and conditions as well with your invoicing and your and your and your scope of work. Let's say so that is very important that that is reviewed properly. In many cases, of course, as I said, like you know, if you're doing your research and you understand what kind of information you want to put on your terms and conditions and your contracts, okay, that's great. They still have that um, that person, that legal counsel that can look at it and really review and and see what you miss because you sometimes you know there may be things there that you're missing that are not in your radar so very very important and when it comes to ip the the intellectual property right that your business is making sometimes your business is making something that uh, it's unique sometimes it's uh, providing a unique type of service or a unique type of um, experience or a unique type of product uh, um, specifically right to to the world 
Um, you want to make sure that if that is something that you've created, that you invested a lot of research and development time and money, of course, investment, that it is covered and 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 a good IP lawyer or a good IP uh, legal counsel will be able to guide you through that as, as specific. There's a lot of resources from the Canadian International and Property uh, Intellectual Property Office, CIPO, um, that you know you could use to learn more about those particulars um, that are available. However, you will still need to have a a, a lawyer that that will help you with the patents. Let's say if you have to to put patents for your product or 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 service, right? And these are some of the things that you know CIPO will be able to guide you through. So I always say we have a lot of different. Uh, partners across the ecosystem when it comes to exporting. Uh, I like to call the Team Canada approach, right? Where, you know, mm -hmm. if you need like specific areas of um, support, like market intelligence, well, that will be the tree, the tree commissioner service. If you're looking for more of financial advisory type of service, EDC will be able to help. Uh, if you're looking for training, FIT will be involved in that, right? So um, any any time that you are looking for uh, something that needs to be done, most of, more than likely there will be some agency or government entity that will support up to a point of course right there may be areas where you know the next the next level is to hire a particular partner right like a lawyer or a or a tax uh, consultant or a tax accountant right that is uh, focused on international taxing let's say mm -hmm. so hopefully that that gives you some idea of like the complexities but with all these things that we're we're sharing i don't want to always uh or, or i don't want to portray that you know exporting is a difficult thing. I think you just need to be very well informed. That's about yeah. it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you, Miliana. Um, Laura, before I get to you, Nancy, I'd love to um, pass it over to you in terms of what steps you took when um, you were starting to export that uh, in order to support or to protect uh, yourself and, and your business. Um, yeah, so we did decide to do uh, like trademark um, our name. Uh, we could not trademark our, um, I guess, our products itself or the recipe or patent it um, because we did not obviously invent pecan oil. Um, and also that's the most, um, that's a costly um, route to go to. But in terms of trademarking to make sure that we protect the brand itself, uh, that served as a protection as well. Um, it also gives you more recognition uh, when you're going overseas as well, because it shows that you have done, you know, the extra work to, uh, that you are like a real company, right? So it gives you that extra credibility. Um, and then in terms of you are a consumer-based product, um, if you do have your products on per se Amazon, then you're able to not just list the products, but also be there as a brand, which means nobody else can be selling your products in there without mm -hmm. you giving them the permission to do it, which is very important now uh, that everything is online too. So that is something that we did decided to invest. Um, it was about $3,000 um, to do um, each. So $3,000 Canada, $3,000 in the US. Um, however, you are able to get, as I mentioned, the grant. So like the Canex for grant, um, if you do put it into your application, then uh, you'll get half uh, or 50% of the cost covered by the grant. So that is something that we did utilize. And um, yeah, so we are happy to say that it, it is almost um, finalized. It, it does take up quite a bit uh, of time, about two years for like the beginning to end. But once you start the registration project, um, once you register, nobody else can come in and say, you know, like I had that name first. It's basically first come, first serve. So that's why it's so important to do it before you go into the other market. Thanks, Nancy. And Laura, do you have anything to add to that before we go on to our final final piece? Yeah, no, that was really good. They yeah. they both took the words out of my mouth <laughs> about the trademark. That's usually the first step, right? When we're looking at IP, it's usually is that is your brand available for use in your target market, hmm. right? It's just, it's a simple yeah. search. You can you can find the database um, search link through SIPO. Uh, as Emiliana mentioned, uh, a Canadian intellectual properties organization. So that should be your first step. Can I use my brand name in my target market? Yeah. So, and Nancy covered that really well. So nothing more to add. 
Wonderful. Um, I, I do yeah. have one more thing to add to um, in terms of um, doing services or product, you have to make sure um, because of the tax regulations, um, for example, you're doing business in the U.S., you have to make sure you're not taking any payments when you are in the U.S., otherwise you are illegally working there. So if you are doing a trade show, if you are doing like sending um, a PO or a document or something, you have to do it all when you're in Canada. Um, so when you're in Canada, you have to send that and then receive payment when you are in Canada because otherwise it's the tax regulations. But once again, as Emiliano mentioned, you have to just make sure you're knowledgeable and just make sure you have somebody who has the knowledge to really walk you through the steps for that. Thank you, Nancy. Great, great point. Um, all right, so we've got uh, a few more minutes left and there's one more piece um, that I'd like to, to cover. Um, and that's uh, banking implications. Um, now, in terms of funding your export journey, we will also be doing a separate webinar on that. So the various different um, avenues that you can go down to, to fund this journey, uh, we will be uh, covering that in a separate um, webinar. So for that purpose today, we won't really be, be talking about that. But in terms of things like currency exchange and, and taking international payments, um, Laura, um, if, if you're okay for me to go to you first, um, what financial considerations should Canadian entrepreneurs keep in mind um, when planning to export their products or services? I guess just general, general financial considerations. One big thing to consider is that your, your cash flow, right? And, and ensuring that, you, because timelines are longer from the time you manufacture that product, ship it and get paid from your foreign buyer. That's a long timeline. So do you need to, you know, bridge that gap? Do you need, you know, a loan, working capital loan? I know Emiliano can speak to that. Um, but um, just those consider, just keeping in mind that timelines are very long and, and there's a long time before you get paid. So I know Nancy keeps mentioning about funding, um, like government funding for, you know, whatever aspect of your market expansion. Um, but just like there's support with funding to do different marketing initiatives, there's also support for funding. And I'll, I'll just let Emiliano speak to that um, more. I was just pasting the information from our, our previous month webinar regarding cash flow. So if you guys wanted to watch the on-demand uh, version, it's there, the link. But yeah, when it comes to... Um, uh, to the, the financial part of your business, right? And and I think it was Nancy that mentioned it right at the beginning where when you're looking at what kind of um, funding you're going to require, right, for the particular venture, do you actually have the money, yes or not? Um, the, 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 the idea here is to make sure that you have your, in, in your, in your export plan, most likely there's going to be a section regarding you know what gaps you're going to be facing in the future for that particular market in terms of like when the invoices are going to be sent when you're actually going to be getting paid there's going to be a period always that you know between um the the moment you send your invoice and until you get paid that you know you're going to have to finance the transaction right so how are you going to be doing that and it's very important that you have really good records of that because the bank is going to require um, specific information right from your financial um, uh, uh, documents uh, or your accounting right that it's uh, going to look and let them know exactly which parts of your uh, of, of the months or the periods right that where you're going through um, through need let's say some financing are going to be in the red and then where are you going to be back in the black they, they want to make sure that they um, are getting paid back whatever they are lending you right so uh, there's multiple ways to do this. And one of the things that I will always say to to businesses is ensure that you are working with the with the right financial institution in the sense that are you using like the small business or the commercial segment side of things, not your personal type of stuff. Obviously, when you're starting your company, most likely you are using your personal bank account, maybe a personal credit card. So a lot of the transactions that may not be recorded properly just for that reason, right? So, um, you know, go sit down with your with your banking institution and, and, and make sure that you're separating those two things because your business is your business and your personal life is your personal 
uh, financial situation. So this way your business start getting that um, that that history, right, of the type of transactions that they go through and the type of funding or or um, financing that you're going to need. So once that's that, you know, with when it comes to EDCs and, and our financial services and all that, like the bank usually partners with us, depending on the type of um, uh, solution that they need to provide you with. Sometimes banks are a little bit uh, hesitant, right, to to lend the money. And then it's uh, it's in the cases where, where you know, with, with your commercial um, banking partner, right, we come in and then we will say, okay, well, looking at the, at the deal, right, we were looking at this particular particular project we're willing to put in let's say a guarantee to to this uh, loan so that they understand that yes they will get paid right so um obviously there's a lot of eligibility that you know we go through we we do our own due diligence right when we're dealing with clients and all that too as well so um i'll recommend that you first approach your financial institutions just so that you know it's very clear and obviously that is the first place right we come in probably a little bit later once your 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 um your segment right from goes from the very small business into the commercial side of segment uh, of things, but we have the knowledge. We have also some solutions that are available for for companies, such as for example, like um, credit insurance and things like that. So if you take a look at our website at edc.ca, you'll see able to see that. And if you have any questions, there's the phone number and the forms to submit your questions as well. Thank you, Emiliano. And Nancy, very quick, well, there are a few minutes left. Um, can you just talk about your experience in, in navigating uh, this side of things? Uh, yeah, I think it would just depends on if you're doing direct to consumer or if you are using a distributor or like going more uh, commercial orders. Uh, for us, because we have through Fair, Range Mean, the other platforms that I mentioned, uh, we were required to have a US account. Uh, so we use the platform, it's called OFX. So basically gives you um, just an international bank account. Um, you can accept payments from the US or you set up any currency that you want. And then you transfer those funds into your Canadian or whatever account it is. Um, another thing that you do really have to keep in mind um, really quickly is just the pricing of your products, right? Um, exporting, um, it comes with a lot of costs that you might not really foresee uh, right away. So your shipping costs, your tariffs, like what are you paying, mm -hmm. um, your warehousing, things like that. So really have all of that in consideration um, before you approach, let's say, a distributor or a national retailer, uh, because otherwise you're going to end up losing money if your price is not set up properly. Amazing. Thank you so much, Nancy. And uh, we're, we're pretty much at time. We packed a lot in today's conversation. Um, so thank you so much uh, to everyone for attending. Um, we do have a feedback poll. Oh, it's popped up onto the screen. Um, so to our attendees, we'd really appreciate hearing your feedback. Um, I know there are a few questions that we didn't get to. So if um, if you have any questions that you would still like to answer, you can uh, email us and we'd be happy to uh, facilitate that answer for you. Um, I want to give a massive Massive thank you to our speakers, uh, Nancy, Laura, and Emiliano. Thank you so much for tuning in your time and your expertise and your knowledge sharing today. Um, it was incredibly useful and um, yeah, definitely a lot of uh, nuggets of gold that we that we got into today. Um, and one more thank you to um, our partners, our fantastic presenting partners, UPS and EDC, and uh, as well as Fit, Scotiabank, Startup TNT, and our uh, ecosystem partners as well. And uh, our next webinar is on global supply chain and logistics that will be taking place on May 6th. Uh, we'll be dropping the link into our registration or for the registration into the chat. So uh, please uh, register if you are interested in coming. And, and finally, thank you to our attendees for, for coming today. Um, there were some fantastic questions uh, that were asked uh, by you um, and I saw that there was lots of action in in the chat with lots of resource sharing as well from our from our attendees from our speakers and um, so so thank you to everyone for for coming and engaging in the conversation um, so that is it for our first webinar uh, so I'll let everyone get back to their day um, but thank you so much and hopefully we'll see you at our next webinar thank you so much bye-bye thank, thank you bye-bye